Thank you for watching the Momentum Men's Ministry on the Man page. Today, you will hear a message from Reverend Ben Kazi on what does this mean. Enjoy.
The reading this morning is coming from Isaiah 25 and 1. It says, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Deacon Matthews. Let's all go to God in prayer. Yes. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with um, hands open and praise God, heads bowed, knees bent. Um, just come to praise your holy name, Father. God, we just thank you for watching over us and blessing us through the night and blessing us throughout the week, Father, with encouragement and spirit and health, Father. God, we just can't thank you enough, but we're going to attempt to try this morning and give you the praise, Father. Heavenly Father, I ask you just to forgive us for our sins, seen and unseen, heard and unheard, Father. And it's bless us as we go into our... Uh, and to repent to you, Father, to uh, with wisdom and knowledge, God, that we come out of it learning more than we knew before. Father. Heavenly Father, I ask you for uh, the health and strength of our, my brothers on the phone right now, God. And I ask you to bless all the families that are represented here, um, and from family to friends and loved ones, God, that need your blessing and health and strength and definitely with spiritual, spiritual help, Father. Heavenly Father, I ask you just to bless us all as we continue to um, walk through this valley that you have us in in this pandemic, God. But in this pruning stage, Father, I ask you to strengthen us so that we can find our way and be even better afterward, Father. Dear God, I ask you to bless the um, preach word or the spoken word this morning that we're going to receive. Um, bless our hearts so that we can receive it and strengthen us as a community so that we can go out as beacons of light, Father, into the world and continue to shine so that we, if they, people know um, that there are any part of your sins, um, know you better, Father, and encourage those who are Christians and who do want to be more encouraged, Father? We have the Father, we just thank you again for bringing us this morning. We have iron shop and sharpen iron in the situation that we're in, Father, and continue to bless us, Father. I ask you to bless our pastor, his family, continue to bless the uh, Church Without Walls family, and all the ministries represented. I love you, we thank you, and ask all these things in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, brothers. We will ask for um any first time visitors uh, at the end of the presentation so if you'll stand by if you're with us for the first time uh, we want to come back to you and hear from you <clears throat> in the meantime we want to go over our mission statements our first mission statement is our church's mission statement it reads the church without walls is committed to bringing men and women who do not have a personal relationship with jesus christ into fellowship with him and into responsible church membership through equipping believers, enriching persons, evangelizing people, and edifying missions. The moment and men also have a mission statement. And we will read that. The moment and men's ministry inspires, equips, and mobilizes men of all ages for vital, passionate, Christ-centered living and service and foster an atmosphere, atmosphere of encouragement, encouragement and brotherly accountability, accountability for the building of the whole person, the church, and advancing the kingdom of God. If we can go back to our agenda and begin our presentation, I'm going to turn this over to one of our own brother, Reverend Ben Causey uh, from the Eldridge campus, Ben are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Amen. Amen. Ben Causey. Good morning, brothers. Uh, I want to thank uh, thank the leadership of the uh, of the men's ministry for this opportunity to speak to you, brothers, this morning. Um, our text this morning for the lesson can be found in Acts chapter two. Uh, I'll give you a moment to turn to Acts chapter two, and I'll read that for us. It'll be verses one through fourteen and verses thirty-seven through thirty-nine. And it reads as follows. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God hearing Jews from every nation under heaven. They heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, 
because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, on all these who are speaking Galileans, then how is it that each of us hear them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Eliamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontius and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Now let's move down to verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Brothers, I want to present to you this, uh, the title of this lesson in the form of a question. And that question is, will you be ready for the question? Will you be ready for the question? In our text this morning, the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. There are 120 believers who are filled with the Spirit and began to speak in other languages. There were Jews from all around the world who spoke various language, languages visiting Jerusalem. Each of these Jews heard them speaking in their own language. Uh, there was a search for significance, a uh, question for meaning, and Peter stood up to give answer to their questions and to clear up the confusion. Now I want to talk about what's happening, what's happening now. God uses the event at Pentecost to get the attention of all of those who are gathered in the city. And today we have COVID-19. Pentecost was good, and COVID-19 isn't good at all. With the arrival of COVID-19, many lives are in grave danger. There's panic throughout the world, not a country or region, but this pandemic has impacted the entire globe. Uh, there is no more leisure and relaxation, no matter who you are. This has impacted the rich as well as the poor, the haves and the have-nots. There has never been an instance in our lifetimes where the entire world was told to stay at home for weeks indefinitely. We can't travel as we once did. We, we can't even move freely in our own neighborhoods and, and visit the places that we normally would visit. In the past six weeks, there have been over 30 million unemployment claims. That's 30 million unemployment claims in a period of six weeks. And we have no clue as to when things will go back to normal. Now, as men, what we tend to do uh, to get our minds off things, one of the things we, our favorite things to do is we turn to our sports. We turn to ESPN. But as it is right now, there are no live sporting events taking place. We can't go to the park and shoot hoops. We can't go to, go to the uh, golf course and swing our club. Uh, our lives have been disrupted. Normally, we would go out to get our mind off things. We may go to the comedy club go to a concert, a jazz club. Uh, I love the performing arts, as I know some of you do, and we would go to, uh, we would like to see our performing arts, but none of, none of that is taking place. No movie night, no date night. Well, you can have date night, but you, you better have it at home if you want to stay safe. Um, but now on a more serious side, 
we are dealing with a virus that we know very little about. Uh, we, we have various hypotheses about how the virus is spread, and, 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 that, and that hypothesis gets blown up, it seems like, every day with something new coming out where, the, where they have to go back to the drawing board and say that uh, we have to take new uh, precautionary measures to keep ourselves safe. Uh, doctors and nurses are working around the clock on the front line, and they're very overwhelmed with the challenges that face them. We've even heard recently there was a doctor, I believe it was in New York, who unfortunately took her own life because she was so overwhelmed with the task that she was faced with and, and having to see patients dying and she could do nothing to help them. There, there are countless uh, people dying because of this disease. And unfortunately, because of, uh, it's so contagious, um, they have to die in isolation. Their family members can't even visit them in the hospital. We are dealing with something, brothers, that is very serious, very serious. Uh, there are many people scared and they're, they're frustrated and they're full of questions. They're full of questions. Now, let's look at something that many of us as believers have to deal with. Why is there suffering in the world? Why is there suffering in the world? Innocent people are dying as a result of COVID-19. I remember uh, there's a story in the Bible where there's a man who's born blind and the disciples uh, asked Jesus, uh, now he's born blind, so the disciples asked Jesus, uh, Jesus, how is it that this man was born blind? Who did sin? Was it his father or was it his mother? And Jesus said, neither of them sinned. It, it wasn't because of that. It, it was because God, it's because God will be glorified through this situation. When we see suffering in the world, it is not always because of a person's sin, but it is because of the presence of sin in this world. Let me explain that to you. When we look at Genesis 2, 16 and 17, in Genesis, uh, God warns Adam, and he speaks to Adam, and he tells him, you could eat from any tree in the garden, but this tree with the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil you ought to stay away from this tree. And he warns Adam and he tells him that if you eat from this tree in that day, you will die. And what it's talking about, it's talking about spiritual death and eventually physical death. That was the warning. Now, when we move to the very next chapter, it didn't take very long, the very next chapter, Genesis chapter three, verse seven, we see that Satan comes into the garden and he entices Eve and she eats the fruit and she shares it with her husband. And at that point, sin enters into the world. Now, just like with us, with Adam and Eve, when they ate that fruit, they did not understand what they were getting themselves into. As a matter of fact, they did not understand what they were getting all of us into. At that point, sin enters the world. And let's look at one of the first casualties of sin. We have Cain and Abel, the children of Adam and Eve. Now, Cain made his offering and his offering was not accepted by God. Abel made his offering and God was pleased with his offering. Abel did not do anything wrong. Abel did not do anything offensive to God. Abel did not deserve what came to him, but Cain, as we know, slew Abel. Was it because Abel had done anything wrong? Because Abel had sinned? None of that. Abel died simply because of the presence of sin in the world. And that is what we are dealing with today, brothers. We are dealing with the presence of sin in the world because everyone who is impacted by this COVID-19 is not a person who has done something um, uh, sinful or done something deserving of that. Even innocent children are dying. And it really, it really breaks my heart when I think about this. Um, I was sharing with Someone I was speaking with a few weeks ago, we were talking and I, and I said, and like, I, I have this way I read the Bible chronologically uh, through, through my reading plan. And as I read, I see when um, plagues come and when disease comes and, and, and when there's a famine in the land, uh, or, or even when the Israelites, as a result of their disobedience, go into captivity. The thing that always troubled me was I would think about an entire nation suffering for the disobedience of some, maybe even a majority, but there will always be some people in that group who are suffering, but they were still faithful. 
And I always, it always baffled my mind how the good have to suffer, even though uh, they are not being disobedient as the masses are. COVID-19 is something that, that we are, we are dealing with here. Now, um, this is the thing that, that, that we have to deal with. God gives us volition. God gives us the ability, the freedom to make our own choices. And uh, in those choices, God does not always intervene when he sees us making bad choices. If he intervened and took away our ability to make choices, then the choices wouldn't be up to us at all. But God is not going to do that. He's not going to do that. And some would try to blame God and charge God with doing evil. But as, as the scripture you see on your screen, John, 1 John 1 and 5 says, God is light and in him, in him there is no dark. Excuse me. There is no darkness. So God does not do evil and we cannot charge him with doing evil. But as I said earlier, sin is in the world. And as a result of sin, we have to deal with all of the consequences of sin. Now, there's a question. The question is, what does this mean? What does this mean? We're in a time like no other in, in our lifetime where persons, no matter what their religious affiliations are, no matter what their beliefs, they are asking the question, what does this mean? What is happening? What should I do? There's a sense of urgency has been uh, created by this pandemic. Um, how do we get rid of it? When will it end? All these questions are coming up. And these questions are very significant. There, there was a time in our lives where we would look for distractions, but we can't, we can't even find those distractions anymore. What, what, should, what should I do with my uncertainty? Do we, what, what, what is the uh, eternal question of significance here? Many people are wondering, they're looking at life and they're pondering life and they're beginning to ask, why are we here? And what, what, is it, what is it with this new challenge that we are facing? Now, some might suggest that this is something new, that we haven't seen this before. But we, we know about the uh, Spanish plague, uh, or Span the Spanish flu, rather, back in, what was it, 1918. We know about that. We know about that. And that, and that happened before our lifetime. But when we look to the Bible, we see that Pan, that, that, that the word pandemic and epidemic was not in the Bible. But the word we see in the Bible, we see uh, pestilence and plague in the Bible. And look, there's uh, 1 King 8 and 37, where it says, when, a fam when famine or plague comes to the land, or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, or when an enemy besieges them in, in the city, uh, uh, or whatever disaster or disease may come, then uh, in Genesis 14 and 12, it says, although they fast, I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Instead, I will destroy them with the sword, fa uh, famine, and plague. Then there's Amos 4 and 10. I sent plague among you as I did, in e did to Egypt. I killed your Young men with the sword, along with uh, your captured horses, I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Luke 21 and 11, it says, there will be great earthquakes, famine and pestilence in various places, uh, fearful events and great signs from heaven. We see here that God sent these things in, in biblical times to get people's attention. And there's the question right now uh, of what does this mean? What is this that we're dealing with? Is it because of something that we have done? Is it because of, of the state of the world? And what I would suggest, brothers, is sometimes God may not be the cause of a thing, but sometimes he allows things to be. And God can use the events of life to get our attention. God is always speaking. God is always speaking because I've heard people say that they want to hear from God. They want to hear God's voice. But the fact of the matter is, brother, is that God is always speaking. 
but the problem is very seldom does the world listen for his voice. Life can be loud at times. It becomes difficult to hear what God is saying to us. But this pandemic, if you will, this pandemic we are experiencing is the equivalent of the volume of life being turned down so that we can hear God's voice more clearly. Now the door of opportunity for witnessing has been opened like it never has been before. Now we hear people on the news and in commercials openly speaking about faith, talking about prayer and the need for prayer, because we have come to realize that we need God in a way that we never have before, not in our lifetimes. We, we need God to intervene because man is full of pride, and oftentimes man will feel like uh, we can resolve these things on our own, but we've come to realize, I mean, they're praying in hospitals, they're praying in emergency rooms, they're praying in intensive care units, and we're talking about people who, uh, uh, many people have declared at some point in time that there is no God, but now they realize there is a God, and <laughs> And he is who we need in order to overcome this pandemic. Um, I, I hear a lot of people, they would say, as you see the scripture there, I'm about to reference that scripture right now. Many people will say, God is on my side. God is for me. But there's an, uh, an incident that occurs in the book of Joshua, where Joshua goes out and he sees a man dressed in battle gear with his sword uh uh, out of his sheet with his sword raised. And Joshua asked the man, he says, are you for us or are you for our enemies? That's the question Joshua poses to the man. And the man responds to Joshua. Joshua thought it was the man. He responds to Joshua and he says, I am the commander of the Lord's army. He didn't say he was on Joshua's side. He didn't say he was on the enemy's side, but he said he was the commander of the Lord's army. And what that would suggest to us, brothers, is that it's not about God being on our side, but it's about us being on God's side. Because, see, if God is on our side, our sides, then that would mean that God is concerned about our agenda. God is concerned about what it is that we want to do. But when we get on the Lord's side, then we're concerned about his agenda, about his purpose, about his will. And that is where we need to be. We need to align our lives with the purposes and the plan of God. Ready for the question. On the day of Pentecost, there was the question of what does this mean? And Peter did not allow that question to go unanswered. Peter was, if you will, brothers, ready for the question. And we must be ready for the questions that are being asked today. In Jerusalem, people wanted to know what was the commotion about in the streets. They wanted to know what was this about with this loud sound of wind they heard and, and why did they hear everyone speaking various languages, languages. The believers were speaking all of these languages which they had not been trained in. And Peter spoke up and he explained to them what was the meaning of the events that were going on at that time. Now, people are asking a question about what is this with COVID-19 and, and where is God in all of this? Why is this happening? Uh, I mean, why and why is our government having such a poor response uh, to what's going on? And as we ponder and entertain these questions, uh, one of the things we must do as believers, as followers of Christ, is, as a witness, you must point them some kind of way, go right back to Calvary, because that's what this gives us an opportunity for. It gives us an opportunity to witness because we're talking about the events of life. We're talking about the events of life when we talk about COVID-19. But when we talk about the events of Calvary, we're talking about things that have eternal significance. Because when you understand what happened at Calvary, that will change your eternal destiny. Brothers, our message is one of hope. It is not one of gloom and dooms. Um, sometimes uh, to see the true, the true uh, hopelessness in the world, 
we, we have to see the truth of hopelessness in the world before we come to realize the fact that God offers us hope. Let's look at something in First Peter, in First Peter three and uh, three and five. We have to be. God has called us to do something. God has called us, and this is what. Listen, listen to what Peter says. Peter says we always have to be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in us. And in Psalm one hundred seven and two, I, I love this. It says, "Let the redeemed of the Lord." say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. In, in 2 Corinthians 5 and 18 of these section, it says, God has given us, and, that, and this is not to the preacher, it's not to the deacon, it's not even to the person who, uh, <laughs> who's who, the pastor of the church, but God has given us, every believer, every person who's called by the name of God, by the name of Jesus Christ, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And what that means for us, brothers, is that we need to be witnesses for Christ wherever we go. We need to be telling others about how good. I hope you heard the song in the beginning. That song was saying exactly what, what I'm saying right now, is that we need to share our faith with the world. And now we have opportunity like we have not had before. How to be ready is the question. I know that that may be the question for some, especially for some who are new to the faith. How to be ready? How do, how do I share my faith? How, how do I know what to say? How do I respond to people? I mean, my, my, my knowledge of the Bible may not be uh, uh, like that of, of a preacher or a pastor, but I do want to share my faith, but I just don't know how. Let me tell you the first thing you need to do. First thing is spend time reading God's word. You got to spend time in the word. You, you have to do that. At Psalm 1 and 2, it, uh, if you look to that, it'll tell you about the significance of spending time in God's word. It's not only spending time in God's word. It does many things for you. But it, it, when you think about it, if you are going to speak for God, if you're going to be God's spokesperson, God's representative, then you have to know the one whom you are representing. So you have to spend time in God's word in order to properly represent him. Second thing you need to do is spend time in prayer. We have to spend time in prayer. We need to ask God for guidance. We need to ask God for wisdom. We need to ask God for strength. That's going to be in Mark 1 and 35. We see the example that Jesus set for us because one, this is one of many times where Jesus was praying. Early in the morning, before the break of day, Jesus set aside time to spend with his father in order to get his instruction for the day. There are many things going on in that time. When you think about it, think about how did Jesus know where to go? How did Jesus know whom to talk to? How did Jesus know who to heal? I mean, there are many people who needed healing. Now, Jesus, he healed many people, but he did not heal every person. So how did he know who to heal? How did he know who to talk to? How did he know? Because he got instruction from his father to begin the day. There are many people in the Bible who had very rich prayer lives. Any person who did something great for God, they did it because they were in tune with God. And that starts with prayer. The next thing you'll see on the screen, we need to be sensitive to the moving of God's spirit. We need to be sensitive to the moving of God's spirit. And get Galatians 5 and 18, as well as 25, it, it speaks of walking in the spirit and being led by the spirit. When we are walking in the spirit, it, it helps us to avoid sin. But it, it not only it helps us to avoid sin, but it helps us to be in tune with God and what God would have for us to do. These are the things we need to do, brothers. We need to spend time in the word of God. We need to spend time in prayer. And we need to be sensitive and in tune with the moving of the spirit. We need to be looking to God to see how uh, he would direct us. Now, what I would tell you is we can't visit like we would and we can't go out and share God's word in a normal fashion, 
but we can pick up the phone and, and call our loved ones, especially those who we know um, their faith is not where it should be, our friends and our associates, and we can share with them because the conversation is going to come up about what we are dealing with and, and the question is going to be about what does it mean. And as we discuss these things about what this means, we can go right back to ultimately what our greatest need is. We need uh, we need a, a cure for this COVID-19. We need vaccinations to protect us uh, from future infections. But what we need more than that is we need uh, a savior. And that person has already been provided in the person of Jesus Christ. Now we must be committed, brothers. We must be committed to this task of being witnesses for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, I like what, uh, but it says in 1 Corinthians 9.22 in the B portion, this is uh, Paul speaking. And listen to what Paul says. Paul says, I become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. By all possible means I might save some. Brothers, as we uh, are posed with these questions of today, uh, let us be ready for the question. Amen. Any questions? Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. Glad you made it, Mark. <laughs> Reverend Causey, um, I've just got one comment going on in the chat room, and it's actually from last week, but maybe it applies to this week as well. Okay. And it's about pruning and is COVID-19 pruning and is pruning certain events or is it something that's going on all the time? Uh, I think pruning is something that's going on all the time uh, in the scripture when it talks about pruning. It doesn't talk about pruning in the sense of of uh, a nation, country, or society as a whole. Pruning is talking, in the Bible when it references it, it's talking about an individual's life. Um, I would not suggest that COVID-19 is pruning because as I said earlier in the message, um, there are innocent people who are dying. I mean, there, I heard the story of there's a couple in Detroit, the husband, uh, maybe I believe he was a, uh, a law enforcement officer and a wife, uh, as a paramedic, and their child, six years old, uh, died of COVID. They lived, but they brought it home to their child who was six years old, and, and she died as a result of COVID-19. Now, can I say that that's pruning? <laughs> no, that's that's not pruning. This is widespread. Um, I, I personally, I believe that when we deal with things such as we're dealing with right now, it is a result of sin being in the world, but it's not a result of the sin of the individual. Death did not come into the world until sin came into the world. Suffering did not come into the world until sin came into the world. So this is a result of that. Now, what I what I do believe of some of the scriptures that we read earlier, uh, where it talked about re repentance and it talked about God intervening, I do believe that that can happen. Uh, that God is able to do that, but but I don't. I wouldn't suggest that this is pruning because that wouldn't be fair to people who are losing loved ones uh, to suggest that their loved ones are being lost because of something that they did. You know. Amen. Amen. And then Mark Lane adds that pruning is actually cutting cutting away. Any other uh, questions or comments? Um, you can come off of. Uh, your mic and ask the question, or you can put it in the chat room, or you can go to slides.app.go.gl slash ak3rp. It's up on the screen. I would like to say that I like the comment about uh, when you had, in, had mentioned uh, that in order to be to represent Jesus in order to represent someone, you have to know the one that you're representing. I like that. I like that. I think that's a profound statement. Great work, sir. Great Thank work, you, sir. brother. Thank you, Ralph. Thank yeah, you. No problem.
Christ. Anyone else? This is Gilbert. Hey, I like it, uh, Brother Cosby. Great message. Uh, and I also like your, uh, we think that you're right on point with your interpretation of pruning, because if you look at pruning in context, the, uh, the objective and the intention of pruning is to bear fruit so exactly. that we might bear much fruit. So I think that Jesus, when he talked about that, he talked about an individual rather than in a collective context. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that, you know, oftentimes we as human beings, because we're finite, we want to understand everything, we want to count and organize everything. We always try to associate an if then with anything that's tragic. So if something tragic happens, we want to say, you know, why? We ask the question, why? But when Jesus talked about the end times and he talked about pestilences and famines and earthquakes, he said, if you look at it in context, he said, these things must take place. Exactly. Okay. He didn't give them necessarily a reason, but he just said they must take place. So sometimes yes. as Christians, we have to be a, try to avoid answering the question why, because there are some things that's not our business. OK, we have to trust God for the why. And what we need to focus on is the what, you know, what are we going to do? And, uh, you know, how are we going to answer the questions when people come to us with those questions? And the answer is we turn to Jesus, just like you said. So that's exactly. all I want to say. I, th I think your interpretation was spot on, my brother. And I thank you for your message this morning. Thank you, sir. Amen. I would like to add, uh, uh, Rem Kaze, I appreciate your message, and I really appreciate your topic title, uh, Are You Ready? Because we all have to be ready. We don't know what God is going to call us to do and when God is going to call us to do it. And if we all look in our lives, there have been things that we did not really like what happened or how it happened or when it happened. But if we reflect back and be honest, we'll see that if we would have just looked for God in it, we would have found our purpose. And so I think your message today directs us to the point of, are we ready to accept God's purpose for us, whatever that might be? Because if we are able to pay attention to God in prayer and in reading our scripture, then we will see God. And yes, uh, this is not a good time. This is, this is a, a pretty bad time for all of us. But God has a purpose for each and every one of us in this time. And we need to do exactly what you said. We need to read the scripture. We need to be in prayer. And we need to find God so he can tell us what our message is and what our purpose is in this time. Thank you. And, uh, and if I can just add, um, I, you know, I think your last point, is our ultimate purpose during uh, during this COVID nineteen? And you said, uh, uh, "Be a witness." And I don't I don't know if you brothers uh, realized it, but that opening song points us to that. It said, "Go tell it." So our our point our purpose in this is to be a witness because people that people that know you are a Christian. Uh, they're going to come to you for answers during this time. Exactly. They're going to, they're, like I said in, you know, four weeks ago, you don't have to prompt. You don't have to prompt the conversation to try and lead somebody to Christ. They're going to come to you now. And that's going to open the door for you to be the witness that God has called us to be. Yeah, we're, we're, the times we're living in are very significant. Amen. Mark, Mark, Mark added by comment, pruning is not a punishment for Christians. It's a reward. And he says, good job, Ben. Thanks, Mark. And brother, uh, brother Ben, I, I was I was just thinking um, my sister in law was asking me some questions. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we 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 have and we will be getting these questions about do you think it's uh, the end of times and what do you think about what's going on? And, uh, you know, for me, uh, some things I know and some things I don't know. And I'm not afraid to tell a person that I don't know. And um, and the reason, and the scripture base uh, behind that is Deuteronomy 29, 29, where it says that the mysteries of God belongs to God. Mm -hmm. Some things that we would never know. And rather than me to assume or... And I'm not saying that anybody on here is is doing this. I'm I'm speaking to me, uh, rather than for me to assume uh, what might be going on, because everybody's looking for answers, 
And we don't always have the answers uh, as as men of God. We have the answers as far as who Christ is and uh, what he did, what he did for us on the cross at Calvary. Uh, and we can point them that way. But in the midst of uh, uh, situations like this, we don't know. We, we just really don't know exactly what's going on. Yeah, and, and the thing, and the reason I said uh, I gave those points at the end about spending time in God's Word and prayer and being sensitive to the movement of the Spirit is because it helps us to put our response to these questions in alignment with the Word of God. Because mm -hmm. if we go based on our own opinion, we can be in error. Yes. But when we yes, understand right. the Word of God, then it helps us to be right in alignment with what His Word says. And and it's wisdom to say. I don't know, as opposed to yeah. trying to speculate. Hey, Amen. That's my point. Yeah. Yeah. May I offer up uh, an observation that I've come to over several years in ministry? Go ahead, John. The, the most difficult question that uh, a minister or anybody that is a, a disciple of Jesus Christ gets is when somebody is in tears and they ask the question, why is this happening to me? Uh -huh. And um, we, can, we can go into great deep theological reasoning, and, but really the question is begging for comfort. And, uh, but at the same time, we have to be biblically accurate and loving at the same time. And that can be very, very difficult. So I've come to understand that there are three reasons why suffering exists. And this is relative to, to us. The, uh, the first is that sometimes it, it's God disciplining us because of some unconfessed, unrepentant sin in our lives. That's a fact. But that's not always the case. And I do not have, none of us have a, um, a omniscient, omnipresent uh, relationship with everything and everybody, so we can only speculate on that. The second is that um, uh, sometimes uh, God is uh, using us as an example for somebody else. It's not that we're being punished. But it's that God is using us as a believer in Jesus Christ to somebody else so that they see how a Christian responds to this. Yeah. And so the witness is important. And the third reason is that um, sometimes, and I personally think often, uh, the suffering is being used by God to get us ready for a mission that he has for us down the road. And that suffering helps us to understand the um, uh, a greater, deeper understanding of God and how God relates to his people. So it could be, the suffering could be a result of sin. It could be that um, we're being, um, uh, where God uses us as an example to somebody else or that God's getting us ready for a mission that he has for us down the road. And uh, I share this with people and I always explain to them, God loves you. Um, so I would encourage them, let's pray and let's get in God's word and and just remember you're not alone. And then hey guys, this, is Joe, but I want this is Juan. This is Juan. Suffering builds endurance. Endurance builds character and character builds hope. So we need more hope. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. This is Gilbert. Um, you know, I was reminded when John was speaking about Book of Job, I had an opportunity to go back and read the book of Job now in this time of suffering. And one of the things, a couple of things I learned when I went through the book of Job is that, you know, Job's friends, when they came to him, their, their mistake was that they tried to attribute Job's condition to something he had done. You know, he obviously had to have done something wrong to have to suffer. Um, and so their, their, their position was accusatory. Job's mistake was he was self-righteous. You know, he felt like, hey, you know, I've been doing the right thing and, you know, I've been uh, you know, I've been righteous and I've followed. And so that was his mistake. His, he, he, he was self-righteous. But when God showed up, he rebuked the friends because of 
they were wrong. You know, he said, who, you know, who is it that counsels this dark wisdom? You know, in other words, you don't really know what you're talking about. And what God's message was, OK, stand up, Job, because I'm going to question you. OK, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I stretched out the sky? God began to question Job about his majesty. And all Job could do was bow his head in humiliation and submission, because what God basically said to him was, you trust me. I got this. OK, I got this. I'm from everlasting to everlasting. I'm the alpha and omega. I'm the beginning. I was in the beginning when the beginning began. So what you need to understand, what we as Christians need to understand, we can't always figure it out about why we're suffering or why suffering exists in the world. But what we can do is we can trust God's omnipotence, his omniscience, his power and his love for us. And so sometimes all we can do is like Job, just bow our heads in submission to God, submit to his will and his way. And understand that uh, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ and that God got us. You know, and, and one thing I can say about Job's friends, even though God rebuked them, when they were suffering, two things I can say that I admire about Job's friends. The first thing is they showed up. A lot of times when people are suffering, all you can do is show up. But sometimes we have to show up, but then shut up. OK, because we can't we can't explain away suffering. So just show up and be there in person to hug and to press the flesh or whatever you need to do. And the second thing I appreciate about Job's friends mm -hmm. is that whatever they said to Job, although they were wrong, their counsel was wrong, whatever they said to Job, they said it to Job. They didn't go around spreading their, his gossip, or spreading gossip about his situation or go around talking to other people about what he may have done. Whatever they had to say to Job, they said it to Job. So I think Job, you know, I would encourage all of us to go back to Job during this time of suffering because there are some good nuggets of truth in there about how we as human beings and Christians respond to suffering. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, brothers, for your comments. Uh, one thing I'll add to that, uh, we were talking about the answers, the reasons for suffering. This is some, I work with the youth, and one of the things I share with the youth is um, – Sometimes you just don't have an answer. So, and you got you to gotta admit that. Sometimes you just don't know. Um, there are many things that we experience in life that we will not receive an answer to until we cross over into eternity. And like the song says, we'll understand it better by and by. Because in this life, we may not be able to handle the depth that's required to understand why God is doing what he's doing and what God is up to. I mean, some things we're just not going to understand in life. Because with Job, Job uh, was, it wasn't explained to Job that God and Satan had this conversation. And that's why God allowed him to be tested, because he wasn't ready to handle uh, that level of knowledge. Amen. Amen. I want to, uh, I want to, uh, Thank you, uh, Reverend Causey, and say to you that in the chat room, there are uh, a number of encouragements there. So if you have a moment to look at that, I think you have, but just want to make sure you see all the men who have um, offered some encouragement. Um, and then Thank you. I, want to, I want to pray for you, uh, and then we want to move on to the ministry announcements and praise reports. And so let, let me pray for you real quick and we'll move on to our next part of our fellowship. Our Father in heaven, how we bless your name and we thank you, God, for this moment in time. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to fellowship online. And we thank you, Lord, for Reverend Causey and his preparation. And we thank you, Reverend Cause, uh, Reverend, Lord, for Reverend Causey's delivery, uh, Lord, and his love for you and your word. We ask God that you continue to bless him and return to him the time that he spent, Lord, that he might uh, always be encouraged to share with others. Uh, bless him now and bless us all as we go uh, from this fellowship in due time. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Um, any Ron, if you're on any ministry announcements, Mark, if you're on any ministry announcements or any others, um, Mark Coleman is also on any ministry announcements. Let's make those at this time. I do have some announcements, really, um, and I guess we'll come back to our first timers. Um, yeah. Uh, one announcement is, um, and, and everybody knows this because you should be getting the, um, the, the emails, the text blasts, and it's on Facebook. Make sure you tune in on Sunday mornings uh, via the web. This Sunday, we're going to have virtual communion. So have your, um, have your uh, uh, 
have your have your uh, bread and your your juice ready so that you can take communion along with uh, with Pass and the entire church family. Uh, also, uh, we are starting uh, virtual small groups on May 11th. We do have two men's classes that are going to be uh, during the week. There's one class on Tuesday at 7 p.m. And that's going to be the Essentials of Effective Prayer. And that's going to be uh, online via Zoom. When you, Once you go and uh, sign up online, you'll get the uh, the information uh, emailed to you regarding uh, the links and the class when it starts um, and the facilitators of. Thank you for watching. If you would like to join one of our live sessions, then please go on Facebook, type in Momentum Men's Ministry and like the Momentum Men's Ministry that has the gold M as its symbol. It will allow you to be able to get updated information daily or weekly about our live next session, as well as some encouraging information. So join us every Saturday at 7.30 a.m. Central for the TCWW Momentum Men's Fellowship. Also watch us on Facebook, Instagram, or live.tcww.org for live worship each Sunday at 8 a.m., 10 a.m., and 12 p.m. Log on to the churchwithoutwalls.org for all church events, announcements, and giving. Thank you for listening, and I pray you have a blessed day. In Jesus' name, amen.